sometimes you just got to blow it out. You just got to give God all you got. We should do that all the time, but we don't always. But when we, when we shift our focus from what other people think, from what I look like, from what I think about myself, and we just, we just lay ourselves bare to God, something happens to us. We change. We begin to shift, and we begin to, to, to look more like Christ in the way we behave, in the way we believe, in the way we think. And I want to start something this week. We're going to look at the psalm, psalms for the next several weeks. I think foundationally the church is, is the church, not us, not just the church, the universal church is in a tough spot. S struggling to find our identity when we never should have lost our identity. When we never should have, have had anyone doubt who we serve, why we serve, and what we do. And so what I want to do is I want to go to the very first psalm, so Psalm 1. Because this is the gateway to the entire rest of, the, of this book or these songs and these, these teachings, these um, incredible, insightful um, views from, from different singers, different writers, uh, kings. And it gives us a, a very rock-solid foundation on, on, on how we can live our lives. That saying it can be joyful when, when, we, when we falter, when, when we fall, that, that we know that, that we can actually get back up and that we're not alone. We live in a world where, where if you're under 40 years old, for the most part, you feel loss. You feel like you've lost culture. You feel like you've lost purpose and meaning. No one understands you. And that's not all under 40s because under 60s, well, over 60s, I, I think in general, and Scripture teaches us that unless we hang on really tightly to God and walk with Him consistently, not in a passive, but in, in a very intentional way, then we're, we're going to succumb to, the, to the, the trials of this world, to the doubts and the fears that oftentimes are of our own manifestations. And a lot of times, we simply don't listen to the right people. We don't listen to the right book. We don't listen to, to what we know and, and, and the one who wrote the book. And so that's where we're going to begin this morning, is we're going we're to talk about, about wisdom. We're going to talk about intention. We're going to talk about, about focus. Um, so let me just read. Let me begin in verse 1 of Acts chapter 1. Now, I'm sorry, Acts. Psalms, I, I, I just flew by Acts again. And it's like, no, wait, we're in Psalm this morning. Psalm chapter 1. And it begins like this. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaves do not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let me pray. God, I pray that you would just bless the reading of your word. Father, I pray that as we allow you to speak to our hearts and minds this morning, that, that we would pay attention. We'd pay attention to you. May we honor Jesus. It's in his name I pray, amen. So it begins with how blessed... And this is, this is a God word. This is a God intent. It's, fine. it's the favor of God. How, how favored we are in God. And so he says, basically, how favored is the man who does not walk in the counsel of wicked. How divinely favored. How, how blessed are we by, by, by the creator, by the savior, when, when we stay away from that which draws us away from him. And it's easy to do. It's, it's easy to be captured by false teaching, 
by, by false leaders, by, by different ideas and ideals that, that simply are contrary to God. And the more we believe, the more we lean into those falsehoods, the farther away we, we really find ourselves from the principles of God. From the person of God, even though he's always with us, the spirit is with us, he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. But when we start saying, I know better than God, then we're putting a barrier up, and it's sin. We're putting up a barrier that says, God, I really don't need your counsel. God, I really, I know what's best for me. Have you ever said that? I know what's best for me. I, I want to tell you, don't say that anymore because we don't. Because what's best for me might not be best for me in two seconds. So why don't we instead, God, what is best for me? God, help me to, to understand. His word says if we seek him, we'll find him. And when we seek him with all our heart, man, our world changes. And yet we're going to the internet. We're going to Fox News, CBS News, MSN, CNBC. Uh, we're going to the internet. We're going to all of these different places to find, to find help in, in, in what to think and what, what to be, believe and, and, and how to behave. And, and quite simply, we'll never find the answers there. And as his kids, as the church, as Christians... We, we have the answers at, at our disposal. Now, I want to remind you, this is not a New Testament book. This is an Old Testament. This is, this is before Christ. And so, so the principles, even though it's an Old Testament audience initially, it's still about leaning into God. We're, we're, I, I feel the New Testament church... And all that follows, we are, we are so blessed beyond measure because Jesus paid the sacrifice. He paid it all so that, so that we don't have to, to do sacrifices and, and blood offerings and wine offerings and grain offerings. He said, all you must do is, is admit that you're a sinner, believe that I am the Messiah, that I am the, the way to salvation, and literally put your faith in me and trust me. But the caveat to that is we can't do it without him leading us to do it. So he says, I will draw all men to myself. And then basically we get to choose. Am I going to follow God or am I not going to follow God? Am I going to trust Jesus or am I not going to trust Jesus? See, in Psalm, they literally had to trust God that there was going to be a Messiah. That God was going to be faithful. That he was going to lead them into, into eternity as victors because of what he was saying was going to happen. So the Old Testament level of, of faith and trust, uh, let's be honest, it was a much higher bar than ours because once you profess faith in Christ, you will never not be his child. The Spirit will never leave you. You will always have the encourager, the comforter. And so truly, we live as, as, as Christians very blessed simply because we're Christians. Simply because we're, we're, we're followers of God. And so the psalmist, he says, how blessed is the man who, and I'm just going to paraphrase, who doesn't listen to stupid people. Who doesn't take counsel from those people that think they know what they're saying but have no clue what God says and what is best for you. Because let me tell you, people don't always have your best interest at heart. God always has your best interest at heart. So he says, how blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of, of the wicked. So that would be step one. We, we can kind of do a, a sitting thing. You're standing, you're, you're, you're standing in the counsel of the wicked. And now you're are, 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 I'm sorry, walking and now you're going to stand. So, so basically you're passing by and you're going, oh, hey, buddy. Hey. Oh, come over here. I got some news for you. And then you stop and you... And, you listen, oh man, this is really intriguing. God said that? Well, I've, I've never read that, but, but boy, that's sure interesting. And then we sit down. And then we're fully engaged with someone who's not as wise as someone else. Maybe even as we are, and yet we've given into that temptation to allow someone to capture and captivate our attention. And so it begins by, by actually walking, standing, and then sitting and allowing that to be poured into our lives. 
God says, how blessed is the man, how blessed is the person who doesn't do that? And in our day and age, it might, meet, it might look like this. Turn off the news. Stop going on the internet and reading all this garbage. Spend some, some more time in prayer. Spend, spend some time in the Word. Being knowledgeable is, is not a bad thing, but when it begins to grip us, and capture us, and we begin to have opinions that dictate how we behave, how we treat other people. There was a survey taken, and it was, it was taken from 2018 to 2000, end of 2022. How has the world changed relationally? And the number one change was this. People are mean. People are meaner than they've ever been in the documented history of our world. Number two, they are, they do not have the capacity to care about anyone but themselves. That was number two. Number three, they will always take what they want. Number four, we're not trustworthy anymore. And number five, we don't believe in God as a world. We do with a church. But something is, has fundamentally changed in the way this world revolves. And, and, and the church, the universal church, has gotten wrapped up in that and it's chosen sides. And the only side that we're allowed to choose is God's. And so we have to be really careful who we, who we latch on to. Because it's really detrimental to us, but it literally is devastating to those people that we influence. See, we're supposed to be the people of wisdom. We're supposed to be the people that are infusing our peers, our families, our, our loved ones, our, our work coworkers. We're, we're, we're to be infusing them with, with the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that there is hope. We live in a hopeless world, a hopeless society, and we're not hopeless. I'm not hopeless. Are you hopeless? If you are, I'd love to talk with you, because if, if you're a Christian and you don't feel that life is, is, is worth living and is, is not full of hope and joy and the potential of that, then something is fundamentally wrong, and maybe you just need to talk to someone about it. Talking is good. Praying is good. Reading is good. As a matter of fact, the psalmist goes on and says in verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So, okay, so he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. He doesn't stand, walk, sit, or stand. But he delights in the law of God, the word of God. Now, when the psalmist wrote this, there were five books, the Torah. Well, that's been expanded. There's 66 books. There's an Old Covenant and a New Covenant, an Old Testament and a New Testament. And so we have so much more of the counsel of God. And so as, as modern-day Christians, we have to be careful that, it, that we don't live in the part of Scripture that is so old, not that it's a bad thing, but that we miss that God sent a Savior and fulfilled all of His promises that were in the Old Testament that we don't have to, as I said earlier, don't have to give blood sacrifices or wine sacrifices or, or, or grain sacrifices or, or, or march to the temple. That's not for the church. doesn't mean you, you can't appreciate that, but, but that's, Jesus changed all that. And how do I know that? Because it says so in this, right? John, I'm sure, taught it something similar in... in this morning in Bible study this morning, Cheryl is teaching uh, our kids downstairs that there's good news, there's hope in Jesus Christ, and that we have the, uh, the option and the opportunity to live life differently and not be bogged down by all, all of the weight of the world. Uh, one of my favorite songs is, uh, he, he, he Will Carry You. If he carried the weight of the world, brother and sister, he'll carry you. He's got you. He's got us. There is hope. There's a future. There's an eternity that, that we're, we're dying to get into. Literally. 
Smile, come on. <laughs> he says, you, you want some answers? You want to know who I am and, and, and how I operate and what I like and don't like? Well, just read my book. Just read my book. And don't just pick the good parts. Pick the hard parts. What do you mean? Uh, it says I, I'm better off if I don't steal. But God, I, I, I want what Sherry's got. She's not going to give it to me. The only way I can get it is to steal it from her. God, it's because I want it. She, you've got to be okay with that. Right? No. Now, how do I know that? Let's just be simple. Because the Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Right? So we know all those things. It's pretty simple, right? And yet, it really is that black and white. And that's why I always go back to God gives us two things that we got to master. Loving him and loving each other. Right? That's all we have to master. Everything is born out of those two things. Because I can't love God and hate you. And I can't hate God and love you. And so God says, you want to know? You want to know what's best for you? Walk with me. Don't walk with the ignorant. Don't walk with the, the haughty and the proud. And then he goes on and he gives us an example. He says in verse 3, He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its seasons, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Can you picture that? Trees wither. Trees get old. Trees go through weather and through, through hurricanes and tornadoes and flash floods. And yet the example the psalmist has, he says, just stand firm like they stand firm. Doesn't mean you're, you're not going to fall. Trees fall. Trees get blown away. We might fall down and we might, we might hurt. We might, we might be angry. And yet the psalmist says, just, just stand firm because you're not standing firm in what you know. You're standing firm in who you know and who's got you, who you professed faith to and who, who gives you life-changing, life-saving hope. So just be like that tree that God firmly planted that bears fruit. I've been, I've been fretting all week because of the freeze. I love peaches, absolutely. They're okay, he said. Okay, I don't have to fret anymore. See, there's nothing I can do about it. Dan said the peaches are good. I trust him. He's a, he's a peach grower. So I know that. But you know, I, it's, it's, I have no control over that. I don't even know how to run his wind machines. So I could be of no help. And so what do I do? It's like, oh, well, I hope there's fruit this summer. e or e or. But God says, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. Just trust me. Just stand firm. Stand tall. Hang on. You know, life is a, life is a roller coaster. We have all these plans. And then God allows one a, a, a pet to be sick. Or a child to be sick, or a child to, to, to go to Washington, D.C., or, or, or you know, or, or someone is sick, or, 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 or something. And we're going, but God, that wasn't in my plan. <laughs> right. I said I was going to go, duh, but that wouldn't be polite. Um, of course, because God says, my plans are always going to usurp yours. It, it's kind of like the, the parent-child thing of the, of the past. When my parents told me to do something, guess what I did? The exact opposite of what they told me to. Once. Because I knew there were consequences if I disobeyed my parents. And I grew up in the era where Roy always got spanked for what I did. And I was very grateful for that. No. Our parents never spared the rod. I don't, doesn't matter what, what you think or what, but that, that was my upbringing is we knew that if we misbehaved, it hurt. Because there's always pain and, and suffering and, and, and hurt when, when, when we're disobedient. 
That principle doesn't change as Christians. God says, walk with me, and you're still going to hurt. There's going to be pain. But when you, when you do it in, in, in sin, then the consequences are, are even more magnified because you're doing it apart from my grace and apart from, from, from my intentional mercy. I just want to draw you back into the fold to get you back on that narrow road on that path. See, a lot of times we self-inflict. I do. Oh, and I hate that about me. I am sometimes the most ignorant person in all the world. I want what I want. And, and oftentimes, Diane is like, well, just stop it. It's like, but I can't. He's like, well, yes, you can. But I don't want to. Ah, that's the key. I don't want to. So God, here's it would be the prayer. God, help me to want to. God, help me to want to do what's best for me, what's best for you, what's, 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 what's best for, for, for your kingdom, God. Help me to, to just have a mindset that is firmly planted and, and, and focused on you. And here's what else the psalmist says. Um, he says you'll be firmly planted and all that, and he'll prosper in whatever he does, and then he does the, con the contrast in verse 4. The wicked are not so. Those that don't walk with me, those that don't love me, those that aren't my kids, they, they, they can't stand firm. They can't prosper spiritually, divinely. But they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. And we understand the wind, right? I mean, don't pick up your barbecue and blow it across your yard. But so imagine what it does with the chaff, you know, all that floaty stuff. We get all the, the, the cotton wood and all that that just blows across. That's kind of the picture that the psalmist is painting here is that, I mean, you just got no clue. You, 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 can't, you can't grab at what you can't see and what you can't hold. He says, but they drive, they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. No sinners in the assembly of the righteous. There is going to come a day. There is going to come a time when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't know what that looks like other than what Scripture says, and yet it's true. There's going to come a time when every knee is going to bend. And Jesus is going to separate his kids from those not kids. And there's a lot to be thankful for. There's a lot to be wary of because those that are not his kids, they could be his kids. He's left us to help make that possible, to share the good news, to share the gospel, to infuse their lives with the good news of who Jesus is, to tell them that that there's someone that loves them enough to die for them. There's someone who loves them enough to, to, to defeat death and, and, and be risen from the grave, from the dead. That there's hope in Christ. Let me finish this off. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. The Lord always knows the right way. He always is very privy of what his kids do. He knows all this that happens all the time. I don't know how he does that. I forget where I put my keys. And yet I know the Bible says there's nothing he doesn't know. There's nothing he doesn't understand. There's nothing he doesn't grasp. He's never caught off guard. He's never surprised. He's always all-knowing. He's always all God. So he knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. There's a way... And there's a wrong way. Using biblical terms, the wicked want you to believe that their way is the right way. God says the way of the wicked is never the right way. Ever. The ends do not justify the means. If you had to break all the rules in order to get the results that you, you wanted... You failed. But, but, no. 
there's a right way and there's a wrong way. Have you ever heard that statement? The ends justify the means? But they don't. They don't. God is the only one that has the authority and the right to justify anything. And so he says, kids, walk this way. I remember growing up in, in Anchorage and we were in downtown Anchorage and there, we, there is, I don't know if there still is, there used to be a huge J.C. Penney store, two or three, four stories high. And I mean, it was huge. And I remember one day uh, the whole family went shopping and, and you know, uh, there were only four, of, four boys at the time. And, and you know, uh, the rule of thumb is you stay, st stay by mom, stay by, stay by dad. There's no wandering off. You know, you can't go look at this and that that you, you just, you do what you're, you're told so that we know that you're with us because it's a big store and, and, you know, all this. And, and I remember going there one time and I was just enamored by something and I don't remember what it was. It was probably the chili cheeseburgers. <laughs> now that I think about it. And I wandered off. And, you know, I, I just wandered, and I, I'm, I don't remember eating, but I remember, you know, going and smelling and looking and everything. And then I went back to where everybody else was, only they weren't there anymore. It's where they used to be, and I was not where they were, and so I immediately knew that I was in trouble. But I also immediately knew, immediately knew that I had no clue where they were. Did they go up to the second floor? Did they go up to the third floor? Did they go up to the fourth floor? Did, did they go to the parking garage? And I'm only seven, eight years old, maybe nine. No, it's probably seven or eight. And I begin to panic because all I want is my mommy. And yet I just thought, well, you know, I'm just going to follow this smell. I'm just going to follow this. And, and all of a sudden, my, my mom, and my mom was, you all know, she was about this tall. And at that time, she, she was fairly thin, and she grabbed me by the arm, and she says, where have you been? I was looking for you. You guys got lost. <laughs> I was in so much trouble. I don't know if Roy remembers that or not. See, he, I got in trouble for that one. He didn't. He wasn't lost. He, wasn't lost. <laughs> he was smart. But, you know, that's, that's kind of how we, how we do things with God. Well, God, I was just wandering. I was, I was just following my own path. And here's what God says, but you committed not to do that. You surrendered to me. You gave up so that you'd get me. So just live that way. Doesn't mean we're not going to fall short of his glory. Doesn't mean we're not going we're, we're to sin. It, it absolutely doesn't. Because we all know, we, we know the reality. And yet he says you can always come home. In that J.C. Penney stories, you'll always find who you need to find. You'll always find him. See, my mom and my, my, my family was never going to leave me there, even if they had wanted to. Because <laughs> if I hadn't found them, I'd be on the, the Ray Shirley. There's a lost boy, a stupid little boy, who decided he was, he was smarter than his mom and, and dad and, and brothers and and then, and then the police would have come and, oh, the trouble. So anyway, I, I, I digress. God loves you. He absolutely loves you. Doesn't matter what you did last night. Does, doesn't matter what you're thinking now. God has never not. He will always love you. He will always keep you. He will always, always treasure you. But if you aren't walking with him, then you don't have the benefits of being a close-knit follower of Christ. So I'm going to ask you to do this for me this morning. If you'll stand. Praise team, you don't have to come up. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. We should probably all know what it's just as I am. I love this, and I mean, this is probably one of the most famous, certainly, invitation hymns, because, you know, God does not expect you to be perfect he doesn't expect you to change. He's the one that wants to change you. He's the one that, that wants to mold you and shape you and craft you. And so the song is, is perfect. Just as I am without one plea. He wants us to come just as we are with our doubts, with our fears, even as his children because the world gets the best of us. Our fears get the best of us. But he says, come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you 
So let's sing this song. I don't know what God's asking you to do personally this morning, but if he's saying something to you, if he's drawing you, just do what he's leading you to do. I'm going to stand right here and we're going to sing. So let's do that. So, Harper, I am going to ask some questions to Pastor Ravens. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God? Do you believe that he died upon the cross and three days later was resurrected for the forgiveness of our sins? And have you accepted him in your life as your Lord and Savior? And I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Resurrected. Amen. <laughs> Oops, sorry, kid. Hey, I want you to know, he wore a tuxedo shirt. That's how important this day is to him. Amen. Harper. Thank you, guys. Oh, welcome. Welcome to the family. I'm going to let her put this down. Watch. You know I have nothing to do with that, right? <laughs> Why don't you stand? Uh, they're going to get changed, and if you want to hang around and hug their neck and, and uh, just say, Harper, it's just incredible. Just know we have four more baptisms coming up in the next couple of weeks. So um, just it's ex exciting times. God is blessing us. So we're going to sing one song, one more song. Uh, Sarah, why don't you go ahead and walk up this way. Um, and then it's, we're going to go home or go have lunch. Thank you for being here this morning. I, I feel like it's been very chaotic this morning, and, you know, sometimes it is. And so, but God can work through so many different ways. Let's be in prayer for Maddie Miracle. She truly is on her way to, to Washington, D.C. Or she, is she there yet? She's there yet. So be in prayer for her. She's on her eighth grade trip. And so uh, be, just be in prayer for the Miracle family. Father, be with us as we go our separate ways this morning. Lord, I pray that you would just... Bless each one of us that we would be a blessing to you and a blessing to those people that are in our lives. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. Don't forget opportunities of service this week. See you later.